It is um, our pleasure and privilege to be hosting today's seminar on nanotechnology and warfare. Uh, hopefully by the end of it, uh, we'll all have a better understanding of what nanotech and nanotech materials are, um, how they are and can be used, uh, as well as misused in warfare, uh, and what the legal and regulatory framework around this is. Uh, to help us, or to help get us there to that point of understanding, uh, my dear colleague, Kobe Lanes, who's had a distinguished uh, career spanning academia, the private sector, and international organizations, is here uh, with us from Australia. Um, I'm also delighted we've secured her as a senior visiting fellow here in uh, War Studies. Kobe also holds a number of other positions, so she's a non-resident fellow at UNIDIR, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. Uh, she's an advisory board member of the Carnegie AI and Equality Initiative in New York. Uh, she's a technical expert on the International Standards Organization's work on AI standards. And Kobe is also a co-founder of Responsible Innovation and the Life Sciences with IEEE, the, uh, another uh, international standards organization um, and an initiative that I am also involved um, in. Kobe, it's absolutely wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for staying up. I'm conscious it's uh, very late uh, in Australia just now or very early, depending on which day you view it from. Um, so I'm, again, very happy to have you with us. Um, I'll turn it over to you now for some introductory remarks on nano and war. Over to you, Kobe. Thank you so much, Philippa, for the warm welcome. And thank you to everybody who has come to watch this, as well as those who are online. Um, it is very early in the morning, it's 2 a.m. here, so I can't promise that I'll be as coherent as I probably am during the day, but I'll do my absolute best. and. I'm really looking forward to, to having a, um, an exploration of, of some of the material that's in the book. I've a little bit provocatively written, does size matter? And the reason I've said that is that it's, it's really important to think about nanomaterials and the size that they are, and I'll get into that in a minute. But before I get there, I'd like to say that this is a project that has involved a huge number of supporters. Um, many of them are mentioned in the book and many of them are thanked. No project is ever done alone. And so this is a, has been an enormous undertaking and I'm very grateful for all the support that I've had to get to where I am. I'd also like to, uh, if we could move to the next slide, Meredith, please. Um, I'm currently on uh, Gunnawal land in Australia. This land has never been ceded. And what you're, what you're seeing here, some of you might've seen this already. This is actually a fish trap from Brawarina which is in New South Wales, in Australia. This is one of the oldest known engineering sites in the world. And you, you could walk past it and not know what it is, but it's actually a series of pools that were created to keep and store fish fresh for different periods of time for eating, almost like a, a refrigerator, if you like. And it was in, continu in continuous use up until about a hundred years ago. The reason I'd like to use this image is because when we're talking about the tools that we're, we're about to talk about, any kind of technology, whether it's something as, I won't say simple because this is actually quite sophisticated, but whether it's something as physical as this or something as invisible as nanomaterials has both positive and negative uses. And those of us who worked in dual use know that that's a fairly obvious statement, but for many it's not. And so I just want us to reflect on that as, we're, as I'm talking about these technologies. If we can move to the next slide, please. The next thing I wanna do is, is introduce the concept of nano. So I can talk about it, but I think it's it's best if I show you rather than, than tell you, although I can tell you as well. So for those of you who are mathematical, nano is 10 to the power of nine. For the linguists amongst us, nano also means vavoch or dwarf, meaning very little. But effectively, a, a nanoscale particle will fit 80,000 times across a human hair. And you get a sense from this video of just exactly how small that is. What's really interesting about that as we, we get to this, this level of small, so what you say, it's small, does it matter? Well, it does because particles of this matter have a different surface to area ratio. They sometimes have different properties. They can be 
have uh, either different levels of toxicity or different levels of magnetic magnetic properties. So there are a whole range of different things to, that uh, we don't necessarily know about all of these types of materials yet, and we're still learning. A lot of these materials are also found in nature. So sea spray, uh, volcanic ash, they're not new. We've seen them before where they've been around for thousands of years. The thing that is new is that we can now manipulate them. So the part that, that I was really interested in and, and really as a result of attending many, many conferences where quantum physics and nano were kind of always tacked onto the end as the odd, the odd couple was what does it actually mean when we're talking about nanomaterials? What exactly are we talking about and who cares? Because it was always sort of an afterthought. So if we can move to the next slide, thanks Meredith. The framing that I used was one that is well known or will be well known to many in the room. It's a really predictable standard that we use to review weapons, means or methods of warfare. So whether they're acquired or modified under Article 36 of the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Conventions, any weapons that are acquired or modified need to be reviewed. We also need to have weapons, means or methods of warfare reviewed in terms of their context. That means on the battlefield as they're being used. So these two requirements are fairly obvious. But again, I thought we were a really good lens to say, okay, let's, let's think about if we were actually using weapons that had nanomaterials in them, what kind of things would we need to be thinking about? What would a legal review involve practically on the ground? And when would these reviews have to take place? Which is actually a really interesting question, quite a lot, lot more complex than it sounds. So where did that leave us? It left me picking three technologies and I'll just briefly skip over those. I'm not gonna give you an overview of the whole book. You'll need to read the book yourself to get all of the conclusions, but just to give you a sort of a framing of the thinking around it. If we could move to the next slide, please, Meredith. Thank you, Meredith, for helping me. Um, I would struggle to manage this at this time of the night on my own. So this image is unfortunately all too familiar. Um, at the time that I was preparing this book, what really wasn't a very well-known weapon, but right now it's been splattered across the media. This is actually not a, a nano-enhanced thermobaric, but thermobaric weapons, as um, some of you may already know, and as some of you will be more expert on this than I am, the barrack weapons differ from traditional weapons in that instead of it being, them being made of two materials that interact and explode, they're made of substances that react with the air and as such create a vacuum. They're often used in bunkers. They can reach temperatures of about 3000 degrees and uh, are incredibly uh, violent in terms of the vacuum that they create. So again, what's different? Nanomaterials, who cares? Well, nanomaterial thermobarics can be lighter weight, they can be smaller, you can put a lot more on a, um, any kind of machine that you want to move around. And this, although not particularly interesting, still raises, raises questions in terms of their use, where, how, uh, and in what context they can be used. So it's a really interesting example, a very physical example of nanomaterials, what they might change, what they also might not change. So running through the weapons review, and saying, okay, where these are, and these are actually um, at the time of the, the research we're under development, and I'm, I'm sure are probably now in use. So the next one is, a, is sort of the other end of the scale. Uh, at the time that I studied the research, this was incredibly, hypoth not hypothetical, but it's sort of futuristic. And a lot of the responses I had when I presented this research were, we're really doing that. And now it's, this is a, a sort of a thing of the past. Optogenetics has really been driven by the need to understand more about the human brain. And so optogenetics involves the insertion of viruses or not, increasingly less so, which sensitize opsins in the human brain to nanolasers, very tiny lasers. So singular opsins in the brain can be targeted. And what this is used for is, or has been used for is to focus on what these opsins within the brain can do. Through this research, there was also an awareness that we could erase memories, increase anger, increase fear, change behavioural responses. And so this idea of being able to manipulate the human body on this sort of granular scale, this nano scale, was a new thing that really I wanted to work through what that would mean and what that would look like both now and in the technology as it advanced, but really tried to stay practical and look at the, the technologies as they existed in the present rather than getting a little bit too sci-fi and excited about where they might go. Because it, in effect, the law that would be applied would be the same. And then the third uh, example, the image I use is entirely unrelated to the book. I'm sorry, there are no glow in the dark cats in the book. Uh, although these, these are actually a form of genetically modified uh, cat, which 
you know, you have to wonder why sometimes. But genetic modification has enormous implications and there were pieces that had already been written. There was some really interesting preliminary thinking from the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross on genetic modification, but really not enough, I thought, and not a, not a deeply enough thought or review around what that actually meant. So what would happen if you were to modify genetic um, genetics to perhaps make a population more vulnerable to a particular disease, which of course resonates with us all now, but wasn't really so, so much thought about at the time, or even modifying um, genes in other ways that might create vulnerabilities or longer term effects that allow you to control populations in an armed conflict situation. Obviously it's a longer term thing. I particularly looked at CRISPR-Cas9, which was, again, it's not a new technology, Genetic modification is not a new technology, but the techniques being cheap, simple, fast were. And so uh, this was a, another really area, interesting area to, to run through. So what were my conclusions in an overarching, very generalistic, uh, summarising way uh, on the next slide? There is a lot of law. Uh, I really was quite tired of people saying there's no law, we need a new convention. Um, aside from the lack of political will for new conventions at the moment, just from a practical perspective, there is an enormous amount of international law if you look. And once you start thinking about these technologies in terms of systems, the law is there, the law applies. That doesn't mean that we don't need to strengthen the law. And there are areas in particular, I focus on um, environmental law because nanoparticles pass through uh, water tables and also human membranes. We're just starting to understand how they accumulate in the brain. There are things that we need to be thinking about. There are types of law that we really need to be strengthening that states need to, to participate more strongly in, in making statements about, but we don't need to recreate the wheel. There is an enormous amount of law already. So with that, I will hand over to our highly esteemed uh, guest who was very kindly amidst a very busy schedule agreed to come and discuss this book with us. So over to you, Philippa, to introduce Helen. Thank you so much for that um, overview, uh, absolutely exemplary overview, Kobe, uh, explaining to us, you know, giving these concrete examples, which made it easier to digest what Nano is. Um, and I really love the video, I have to say, because it, in a very visual way, it kind of led us to to, 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 to get a bit more of an understanding of what this nano level uh, really is about. So a uh, great overview, thank you. You've left us a, a feeling a little bit hopeful at the end there that there is all this law out there. So presumably everything is okay. Um, so, so that's so far, it sounds, seems good, right? Um, so thank you uh, for that. I'd like, and now I'd uh, like to bring in the second very distinguished speaker that we have uh, with us today. Um, Helen Durham is an international humanitarian lawyer. She's also the director of it, the international law uh, of international law and policy at the ICRC, the International Committee uh, of the Red Cross. Um, Helen has served as director of international law strategy planning and research at the Australian Red Cross and has worked as ICRC head of office in Sydney. So Helen, um, a very warm welcome to you. Um, it's really great to have you with us. Um, as Kobe said, thank you for finding the time in what I know is an exceptionally busy schedule uh, on a good day and these days are not good days. So um, thank you for, for uh, being with us. Um, Helen has agreed to have what we thought would be a little bit of an informal chat with Kobe about the book um, and the substance of the book and writing the book. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to turn over to you, Helen, and thank you so much again for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. It is a very, very busy time, but in the middle of the night, you always have time to read such a fabulous book. So thank you. It's a real, real honor and I look forward to the conversation. Um, just in a few words to start with, the reason why I think this is such a compelling and important book 
is that you have many excellent international lawyers and you have many technical people. But I think what Kobe has been able to do in this book is combine and synthesize the scoping of existing legal frameworks. And I think I love the idea that the world's okay because we've got law because I live with the fact that we've got a lot of law and the world's not okay and we have to keep working to make sure it's applied. But I do think what Kobe's book does and why I found it so impressive was it's got the tenacity around the legal analysis, but also I would say a, a robustness around the technical analysis and it's bringing the two together, which I think is an absolute, um, absolute uh, necessary. Uh, new technologies and warfare is sadly one of the key priorities. We've got many in the ICRC legal department, but it is certainly one of the top three. And exactly as you articulated, Kobe, I'm talking to my colleagues in Ukraine and Russia at the moment, these aren't science fiction issues far, far away. We are seeing a speed in the use, in the identification, in the framing of what role technology will play on the battlefield. So I think that the uh, combination that you've brought to bear in this book is, is superb. And I think it's something that I'm really, really delighted and, and I think you should be deeply congratulated. And also unpacking it in a way, whether it be the video you just showed us, but in it's a very accessible book for, for those to engage in. And I think we need to do that more and more today because we can't talk in a siloed specialist way. So I wanted to basically just start with those points. But more importantly, hear from you, Kobe, because this is about you. Um, and Maybe I wanted to start off with a very basic question, but it was one I thought about. How long ago did you start this project and, and what made you choose this? You, you, in your beautiful presentation, a few times you said, so it's small, so what? But, you know, what was the so what that, ex that excited you and, and how long has it taken? What's the temporal scope of this book? Oh, I feel old just thinking about it. Firstly, thank you for all the kind comments. I still, I'm very humbled and it's it's been a really long project, your, your question. So until publication from the very beginning until now, it's been close to nine years. So the, the beginning research, I think um, there was some despair about whether I would ever emerge from the scientific research because I did spend a lot of time going down rabbit holes. I was really determined to be sure what I was about that I knew what I was talking about when it came to the science that doesn't make me an expert on the science as I said there'll be other people even here on this presentation I'm sure who are far more expert than I but I needed to be in a position where I could speak with some authority at least in terms of what law would apply and that was what was missing from a lot of the conversations that I'd seen in terms of what brought me here this is a deeply personal project for me. And I've been reflecting on this over the last couple of weeks in particular, having physical copies to hold, but also with the world events unfolding as they have. My father was a, he grew up during the war and was profoundly affected and the trauma that he suffered has affected my family. And I've been thinking about how, how so much of that has actually motivated my work in disarmament and always wanting to be involved in some way in conversations about weapons, even when it's deeply popular and sometimes really hard, particularly when you're in Australia and far, far away. Um, even at universities, these conversations are not well funded and they're often very difficult to have, but we need to be having them. We need to make people more aware of the risks of the technologies that they're developing. Um, and this is something that I've, I felt incredibly strongly about. So I, I hope that it reaches and brings together different communities because those communities need to speak more to each other, not just in relation to nano, but also in relation to the computer sciences, which is what I now work in day to day, and all of the other technologies that they're advancing because we can't afford, the lawyers cannot afford not to be talking to the technologists or not to understand the technologies, I think is the, is the short answer. Great. And I, I mean, I think today, for example, across the road here, my colleagues going back and forth to the GGE on autonomous weapon systems. I mean, it's, it, is, it is trying to break down the siloed communities, uh, which is why I was so, that's such a, a, a great answer, both the personal things. I think if something takes nine years, it's not going to be just to finish the book. It'll have to come from something deeper. So thank you for sharing that. But I also think from an intellectual level, yeah, the silo busting is the only way that we're going to hold humanity together. And that's, that, as I said, that's why this silo bust for me, because I think you can pick it up and have it explained. So thank you. I understand why. I understand how long. Perhaps I'll get a little deeper. What was the hardest thing that you found? Um, what did you struggle with most? And, can, and sort of the flip side of that, what was the thing that you found most, I would say, 
exciting or that captured your imagination most? I'm sure a lot of it is reading through it, the way you've unpacked it. There's a lot of imagination things that make you pop out. I kept reading it to my 17 year old daughter going, did you know about this? Um, <laughs> and she's like, yeah, mom, thanks. I'm just looking on my Facebook. No, it was actually Insta. They don't do Facebook. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about where you struggled and where you got inspiration. Oh, that's a great question. The hardest piece in this work hands down was the structuring I think I must have restructured it at least 10 times it was trying to find a way to make it digestible that wasn't just repetitive or um, spoke down to the audience because when you're combining two different completely different areas of expertise and then trying to extrapolate that across other technologies ultimately um I just, yeah, I remember one time walking around the grounds of Melbourne Uni with Rosemary Gray and I was despairing and she has full credit for this structure where she said, why don't you just do it this way? And I thought, that's just so logical. I hadn't thought of that. So again, none of this is done alone, right? So someone else had the genius idea and then off I went, um, but still trying not to repeat things. The other thing I really wanted to do was weave in the stories, which is not really that traditional for this kind of work. Um, because I think the stories really matter, particularly when we're talking about, I, I, I sort of use the excuse of analogizing, but we also need to contextualize the laws. We need to give them the richness and the depth so that the people who are new to the law understand why they're there, how they're formed, why they matter, how to apply them, um, and to think about them in relation to technologies, because technologists don't necessarily think about what might go wrong or what the potential risks are. Um, yeah, so that was definitely the hardest part. The best part was going back to one of my very first passions, which is environmental law, and reflecting on how we really need to strengthen and think about environmental law in warfare, because climate is the climate change is already here, and we don't have a lot of time to think about fixing it. And warfare contributes to a lot of damage to the environment both in the production of weapons, but also in how, how armed conflict is conducted. And in the case of nanomaterials, as I was saying earlier, long-term, uh, once you have nanomaterials that are released into, into water tables, they're there. They're then ingested by animals, they're in food. It's, it's deeply dark, but it's also something we really need to be thinking about more urgently. And as always, it'll be the women and children who are you know, at the forefront who'll be affected the most. So yeah, it's, it's something that, I mean, I'm presenting it as a negative, but in, on the other hand, I see that as a positive, as an opportunity f to really think about how we can uh, think about reviving NMOD, for example, makes me really excited. We need to think about pulling back some old treaties that we haven't really talked about or used for a very, very long time. Great. No, I, 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 I was, you say, in one hand, you're framing it in negative, but in the other hand, I can see it gives an inspiration. And it is, you know, we are the part of the problem so we are part of the solution in that sense so thank you for that and yes structure is always hard but in the end that it's very well structured so bravo for getting over the hard bit um I want to move on a little bit more around sort of some of your calls or engagement particularly around uh in my experience having been in this role for the last eight years every time we've got a problem people call for new laws you know oh we must have new laws and and I I must admit having recently been in Somalia in Mozambique in other countries you know a little bit of the application of existing laws, whether it's just about distinction and proportionality or, as, and we're seeing this today in the world, or, um, you know, a bit more depth of what we've got can be really useful. Having said that, new technologies put a, a stress test the existing mm -hmm. legal framework in a, in a way that um, perhaps uh, application in more conventional warfare doesn't. So from your point of view, despite the fact there's a little appetite for law and, and certainly chairing many multilateral engagements and negotiations, I think we'd be have to be careful what we wish for. But all that aside, do we need new law? And do you think intrinsically new technologies should always require new legal frameworks? I think I would propose the approach that I've taken in this in this book, which is before we call for it. I mean, I'm, I'm the last person to say it's hard, we shouldn't do it. So even if there's not a huge amount of political will, if we need new law, we need new law. There's no question about that in my mind. But I think that the danger of doing that is that we forget to look at what we already have or at what already exists. And often I find that comes from a lack of understanding of the technology. So you've often got the technologists coming in and sort of wowing either world leaders or, you know, the the 
even just lawyers, I see this on a day-to-day basis in my job where things are being sold, tools are being sold. And once you start scratching the surface a little bit or asking some questions, you realise that they're not really the panacea that, that they're promised to be, or they're not really what's promised. So again, this sort of, it's almost like there's a need for translational work. There's much, there's a much greater need for people who can speak between the communities. There's a need for people who can map sort of what laws apply to those technologies. But then I think to your point, particularly now, and we're seeing this, there are some technologies that are moving at speeds and scales that we really just need to operate differently with and think differently about. But that's not even a, it's not always a question of law either. It's often a question of power. It's a question of, you know, structures and frameworks. Law can't fix everything. I'm, you know, I've been around too long to, to be the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed lawyer going, well, lawyers can fix things. And I haven't even acted as a lawyer for a very long time. There are so many different angles and aspects from which we need to approach these problems. Law is one of them, but we certainly shouldn't, you know, jump up and down immediately and say law, new law is needed, there's a new science. That's that's very problematic, I think, as a, as a first response in every instance. I think you're so right in the sense that I'm often saying law does not revolutionise human behaviour. You know, it gives us a framework, it moves us forward. Um, so I think that the, the, the approach you've taken, which I, I just wanted to stress test a bit there, I think is when we need it, we need it. I mean, as you know, from an institution, ICRC spent 10 years working out whether we need new laws on autonomous weapon systems. We think we do in that space, but not so much in, in cyber. And in these areas, we're still, as you said, behind the eight ball and need to look further. So I like this idea that our energy shouldn't immediately go into, oh, we need new law, but actually analyse what's there. So thanks for that. That. I wanted to dig in for a second. There's many, many things you raise in here, but you did touch on one of my favourite uh, sections of international law. I'm sure everyone has their favourite section of international law as a tattoo, I hope, too, um, which is a bit odd. But I just wanted to ask you for a second because it relates to the Martins Clause, which is one of the oldest. And um, what I loved what you wrote here it, when you said is that, you know, some considers the Martins Clause to be the ultimate legal contingency plan uh, and it just really captured my imagination I do find as um, as a director of a, over 150 lawyers working this area when I get really stuck I do revert back to this very basic Martin Laws principle which maybe not everyone on the on the um, on the event understands or appreciates so I just wondered if you could indulge me you know what what is the Martin's clause and why did you even flag it when it's sort of such an old and some people say vague principle I love old, vague things. I love them. I spent so much time trying to figure out whether the preamble was binding or not legally. Um, that, that was a rabbit hole that, that took some time to resolve. But the Martin's Clause, for those who are not familiar with it, talks about you know doing using weapons in ways that are against the dictates of public conscience. And again, the story is fascinating because there was sort of a you know an impasse. The states couldn't agree. And someone proposed this language and everyone, yes, that's fine. Put it in the preamble. That's fine. Just put it there. And it, it just, it resonates because the law is always, and this is one, another one of those debates that lawyers love to have. It's very boring. Law will always be behind the technology. It's very rarely ahead. And we know that, um, you know, blinding laser weapons are pretty much the only example that we know of where the, the weapon was prohibited before it was used. But mostly these things get used and then they're somehow responded to we can't capture every single possible use of technology and particularly now with the rapid advances in science and particularly using AI and some of the very fast moving technologies, dictates of public conscience is a really powerful tool. The conscience of the, of the public is changing very rapidly and I see this in relation to privacy, I see it in relation to data ethics. It, it will always be moving faster than the law ever can. So having this phrase that is old, as you say, and very general is actually a really powerful tool to say, hey, is this something that people would really think is okay? Um, I think that's a really good one to pull out and use and think about when, you, when you're thinking about developing any kind of technology for something that's, you know, not necessarily illegal, but it's creepy and gross and we don't really like it. You know, this is a, there's a framing for, for thinking about these things. I think it's a wonderful preamble and it's one of, yeah, I, I like it a lot too. Right, well, listen, thank you for indulging me with it, because I find it whether we're talking about nuclear weapons, whether we're talking about new um, new weapons or old weapons, it's just a good go to. And yeah, I was really thrilled to see it as one of the um, one of the elements, at least you you flagged as thinking us through, because I think there is sometimes and this is where it takes it more to the wider community. There is something really important to say hey, I know we've got the capacity to do it, but 
you know, what would humanity think about it? You know, there's there's something there about a dictate of public conscience. So thank you, I think, uh, for indulging me on my favourite piece of international law. Um, if you could now, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind digging a little more on particularly around weapons review. Um, and, um, you know, do you think that new technologies require new thinking in general? Um, you know, we've got the systems, as you mentioned, we've got Article 36, we've got the framework, but what, what do you think about at sort of a more a, a meta level, do we need to think about things differently? Like it is a fast pacing, a pace, at pace, and, and there is sort of, as I said before, stress testing of ideas and ways and, you know, we test something and then we try it. And then meanwhile, they've got industry that has created it. So do you think it generally requires on the whole new thinking? Uh, that is probably one of the biggest challenges, I think, above and beyond new law is uh, that the timing of weapons review is really complicated. And the challenge is as technology advances, it's not even just when technology advances, having spanned international, as Philippa mentioned, having worked in international organisations and academia and, and the private sector, having had the luxury of seeing all three, it's really difficult when the industry and academia in particular are so closely intertwined. And Wendell Wallach just wrote a wonderful piece about this uh, through Carnegie, where he was talking about, you know, the capture of universities by de the defence industry, basically. So defining or separating research projects from weapons development is incredibly hard. And having sat in a computer science and engineering department, I know that many of my colleagues were defence funded developing systems that were ultimately pieces of weapon systems, but they never would have thought of them as such or connected what they were doing to a bigger picture. So there's a problem there in terms of disconnect. The old days where, you know, you had a rifle, you had some bullets, you kind of did a review of how they interacted together was much simpler. And when you get into the life sciences, it's even more murky. Um, I went to a conference, a defence conference, where one of the scientists was working on enzyme inhibitors. And I said to him, you know, what, what do you think these might be used for? And he said, oh, I don't really care. I'm just so glad to get the funding because, again, you know, it's very hard to get money for research, right? So this idea of, of both dual use is not a new thing. There's always been the threat of dual use research. But I think increasingly the the funding is largely, at least in a lot of the major universities coming from either industry or defence, it's driven in a certain direction. When should those reviews take place? Who are the people who are in a place to know about them? And when you're getting into really sophisticated levels of technology, like genetic modification or optogenetics, who's sitting on a legal team in a government that can review these technologies? You know, it's, it's really tricky. Uh, I think the when and the how and the who needs to be thought about much more deeply than is happening now. Great. And I think that's why we keep circling back to this idea of the synthesis between the different experts um, and making sure that those who sit on the are, are equipped to actually deal with the, the challenges we've got. So thank you for that. Um, you did mention that we've got a good and I would say solid existing normative framework but do you think, you know, if, you, if we took aside the fact that it's difficult to make international law and all the rest, where do you think the actual gaps are? Where would you advocate that we would perhaps need to lean into as the international community to make sure that there's appropriate regulation of these types of new weapons? Well, I think uh, one of the most obvious ones is that states need to make it really clear that nanomaterials are included under the biological and the chemical weapons convention. So, at the, oper at, the, at the level of biology that we're talking about, nanomaterials in the human body are oper operating at both the biological and the chemical level. They intersect. So it needs to be really clear that those, those treaties still apply. Also, um, I mentioned before NMOD, uh, the treaty that talks about environmental modification. So I don't think they've met since, nine, since the 1990s. But thinking about how do we affect the environment when we move through it with armed conflict and having seen armed conflict uh, and how it affects the environment. Um, to your point about the Martins Clause, I actually mentioned it a second time in relation to the environment, because if we think back, if I think back to when I worked at the United Nations Compensation Commission, looking at environmental compensation for uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, that was groundbreaking that we were giving compensation for 
non-monetary environmental damage, you know, for, for damage, not just to oil wells, but also to, um, it wasn't just commercial damage for wood, it was the enjoyment of parks. We started to be aware and to pay for things like, you know, mental health. We know that people need in an environment around. So that appetite has changed really quickly. How do we capture that and how do we reflect that? Um, just to, to bounce back to the Martin's Clause a conversation again. But also I think thinking about how and when we, how and when we engage um, with the environment, our values have changed profoundly. And I think we don't reflect that in the current frameworks that we have. Uh, I think that's a really big opportunity to, to be involved. The other thing we haven't touched on is that we're still talking about nano. I haven't talked about quantum. I haven't talked about any other technologies. The siloing has to break down also between the technologies. And we're seeing that again, that, you know, the use of cyber AI, nano, all of these things are interlinked. Things can be activated very quickly. There need to be people who can speak across many, not just legal and science, but also across sciences or see the connections between technologies. And that's hard. It's not a common skill set, but I think we need more people who are thinking like that. No, I think, I mean, yeah, I think there's some big ones, like let's let's know that these are things are being used. They're not, as you said at the start, some science fiction. Let's make sure we have the right people around the table for the right conversations. Let's make sure that we don't spend our energy where we've already got law, but we haven't got political action. But I do like the areas you've unpacked of perhaps where we need to tighten or think. And sometimes in my experience over a number of years, calling for new law crystallizes states to come out and say no no we don't need new law because we've got this law and so sometimes the process yeah. is the product does that make sense to you yeah absolutely i think there's a parallel in um yeah sally mary mary engels talked about oh, yeah. collecting more data like you don't need more data we know no. that the problem you know there's a problem right we know there's a yeah. problem we don't need but you're right by pulling people into the room to either collect more data or talk about the law whatever it is it's the thing that you ostensibly pretending to do you're actually getting states in a room going this is a problem um, the other thing we also haven't touched on but I mentioned the book is that these scientific communities don't think about harm and I have to give credit a lot of credit to my thinking here um, to my time at the International Community of the Red Cross where I worked on this web of prevention how to work with scientists to think more about minimizing risk and I'm sure Philippa would have some some more to say about that as well but people doing research just want to do research. They don't think about the implications or the harms and connecting those people to governance ideas. Um, just last year, I contributed to a paper that was looking at um, using AI to sentence people to death without any judges involved. And this was presented at a, a computer science conference without any kind of batting of an eye. And then someone said, oh, we should probably do an ethics review. And they did an ethics review and still presented their paper. Anyway, we wrote a response called, you know, give me convenience and give her death. And a lot of people said, well, we hadn't really thought about that as being an ethical question. Yeah. I mean, it sounds really obvious to those of us who work in governance or risk or dual use, because this is our bread and butter. We know, we know what the problems are, but for people doing the research or doing the science, we need to connect them more to this way of thinking and also to politicians and state leaders, um, uh, for those familiar with Pugwash, I think there needs to be some sort of similar thing to Pugwash for a lot of the people in the new technologies. So we don't end up with these stale sort of arguments at the point where the technologies are already developed. We're having these conversations early on when they're being contemplated or, or, or grown and, and funded. Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think um, it sometimes horrifies me when, when you do see the capacity that humans can advance without thinking the framework of what it means. So I think that's a really, really important point. Now I'm aware we want to have some time for other people to talk and I shouldn't hog you, um, but I wanted to finish off with one last question and, and, and it picks up on something you just stated, which is about the um, dual use in technology advances um, and the increasing, I would say, connected, uh, cosy uh, relationship between industry and defence. What, you know, you, you flag this a little bit uh, in the sense of them not framing these issues about what they might do for humanity, uh, you know, a bit of a duel between the Martin's Clause and, and, and those that are just go, let's just do it. We don't need to put it in, in that in, in context. But what, what do you think about this dual use in the scientific advances? I'm concerned about the militarisation of research more broadly. I think there's a, a real, there's a lack of, funding and space around the conversations for disarmament and regulation of weapons and an increasing push for you know most a lot of the meaningful research a lot of the funding a lot of the large reputable institutions 
uh, you know, funded by and doing work for defence. Um, in, in some of the tech spheres, it's more the corporates, but it's either way that what's missing are the civil society pieces. And Anya Kasperson talks about Pierre Bordeaux's, you know, social silences, that they're not accidental. There are social silences. There are many things that we are not talking about, that we are not uh, raising awareness of. And the next generations will just not have the time or the space or the capacity to have these conversations. And I think that's something we we critically need to build. We need to build capacity for the next generation to know the risks of, and even just now, you know, with recent events, I, there seems to be such a lack of understanding of what these weapons can do, the harm they can cause. Uh, it's it's really problematic. I think we need to be having those conversations a lot more and how to, you know, how to engage meaningfully in those conversations from a governance perspective. Great, no, thank you. And I think, I mean, certainly in my experience when in reading the book and also talking about this need to synthesise rather than silo, I mean, it's been really interesting here for the ICRC as we move forward into new weapons and technology. We've had to talk with um, the, the, you know, Facebook, the, the, the outside our comfort zone. We're great talking. If you're a non-state armed group and you're, you know, you're doing a certain thing, if you're a state, we've We've engaged with you for 150 years, but if you're like a tech industry person, so luckily I've had to put people on in that space, but I think it actually proves the point that you've got in the book is that we've, we've got to make it more engaged and we've got to reach out and connect more and these things are real and they have that long-term effect. So thank you. I feel like I, I could go on all night or as you would say, all into the morning with this discussion. It's it's really lovely to be able to draw you out on a number of the things in this book, but I won't. I will be a, a, a good guest and pass it over to Philippa uh, in relation to sort of some of the issues she might want to raise or what some of the audience might want to raise. But can I just conclude by saying thank you, Kobe. The world needed your book. We need that book. Um, I'm sure that it will, uh, as many of the great things on the back say, that it will really um, fully inform the debate as we move forward. And I look forward to uh, seeing how you use it even more into the future. But thanks for the opportunity to cross-examine you. Thanks so much for the kind words, Helen, and for your time, especially at the moment. Really appreciate it. Thank you both uh, so much for those really, uh, that was a really engaging conversation and it was such a privilege for those of us listening in to hear your thoughts and um, the things that you had to say uh, on this issue from my own, I'll, I'll take questions in, in a moment, but from my own side, you know, um, some of the things that I took away were really about the skill that it takes to cross this technical um, and policy boundary and how well you've done that in, in the book, uh, Kobe, and how, how that is one of the things that's often, as you said earlier, missing from these conversations around new technologies, around governance of new technologies, uh, especially in the security field. Um, and so we need to think about how, how can we encourage these uh, conversations, these cross boundary conversations um, between, you know, the technical sphere and, and, and the political or the policy sphere. I love, Helen, your, <laughs> your characterization of the book as a silo buster. Um, I think that's exactly right. You know, uh, that's what it is. That's what we need more of, um, these kinds of silo busters. But then there is this question, well, how do, how do we do that in practice? And obviously, this book is one way of doing that. And I think a very important way of doing that. We need to have this kind of more substantive material we can go back to and, and, and draw on. But I, I did want to ask actually both of you, what, what are other ways in which we can uh, encourage these kinds of conversations between technologists on the one hand and uh, policymakers, um, lawyers, uh, practitioners on the, on, on the other, right? Because when, as you were saying, Kobe, when scientists today that even get funded by the military don't even really think about the misuse agenda, what chance do we have of scientists who don't get funded by the military to even think about potential misuse of the work that they are uh, doing? I mean, this is one of these longstanding questions. How, how, how can we get those conversations going? How can we put it into their also very busy agendas and uh, careers when there are no benefits to them of engaging in these kinds uh, of conversations? 
Um, in my own work, I put a lot of my hope in, in the next generation, uh, in, you know, um, in awareness raising, in teaching, in discussions, um, you know, as you were saying, Helen, Facebook and, and these kind of spaces were not so, uh, it's probably not even Facebook anymore, it's moved on to Instagram and TikTok and all these other things, right, that we're even less familiar with. Uh, but that are said, how do we how do we make these subjects resonate with younger uh, audiences who will have to also take up these very difficult uh, questions? Or what are other ways in which we can en encourage these kinds of conversations um, and make them matter? So obviously, a very big question. But I don't know if Kobe, maybe you want to have. Uh, a go, I know you've been engaged in this for a long time. So if, if you want to have a, a go at answering, and then maybe Helen, you might want to say something from your perspective as well. Um, when I was pulling up this video to show for this presentation, I hadn't used it for quite some time. The last time I used it, um, I, well, looking for it, I stumbled across a presentation I gave in 2018 called Fashbook, Is It Time to Unfriend? And I remember giving that presentation and all the lawyers in the room going, why is she talking about this? Who cares? And then just last week, there was an article, uh, an amazing article in Georgetown Law Review about all the harms that Facebook and Insta are causing. And if you actually had a, like a, an alarm for, you know, be like 40% of girls who use this have body images, you know, this, this rate of suicide, you know, suicide and awful, awful things. Um, I think the, the answer is money. It's just, unfortunately, you've got to fund people who can have some time and space to think and do work in these fields. That's one of the things. Um, money to bring people together, money for people to do research on these kinds of topics that are not necessarily, you know, um, they're becoming, in the computer sciences at least, these conversations are being had more and more and there's more and more of an awareness. Uh, the law is moving so quickly in this area. But the other thing is, I think, just learning to feel dumb. Like I spend a lot of my time at work asking questions and not understanding things. And that's okay. I think I've thought about this a lot too. I think lawyers often come out needing to feel or be the ones who know the most about everything. And if you want to engage in multiple multiple disciplines, you, you just have to sit in a place where you often don't understand things and have to ask a lot of questions. And that's just sitting in a place of curiosity constantly, not feeling like you know a lot, a lot of the time. Um, so they're probably the two points that that I would make. And I certainly feel like that every day. I'm constantly learning new things and asking questions that, you know, help me to understand systems that are incredibly complex and changing really, really quickly. But I, Helen, I'm sure you have other things that are more sophisticated than those two points. Not at all. They were very sophisticated. But I, I think, Philippa, you, the, the heart of your question is something I've thought about for 20 years. You know, how do we take very complex things, where, which the whole aim is to influence behaviour and make changes and, and do it in a way where we don't uh, lose the, you know, the devil in the detail. I mean, I, I love Sarah, Sally Mary Engel's work, as you mentioned, and you know the thing that I always struggle with, and it's conceptually very similar. You know, how do you make something universal enough that it cuts through power structures, but uh, but yeah. local enough that it has traction? And you know, I, I think there's something here. How do we make it technically correct enough that it has traction with those scientists, but then along the way, we it doesn't lose the attention of those who are decision makers. And I think that that is the finding that sweet spot. I mean, I would say in this space we need to continue to have the conversations have books like yours I I mean I've, I've got some crazy ideas and it's not as director of law and policy so this is nothing to do with ICRC for a moment I'll cover up the emblem wherever it is um I think that you know we have TEDx talks maybe we need to have a you know tech tech why talks once a year where we have people come up and have to reduce what they've got into a eight 16 minute bit you know why don't we start there could be some things like that um, certainly in the ICRC, one of the ways we've tried to get more traction around just basic education about iChill is using video games. We've got a whole section now of virtual reality, um, embedding that into video games. Why don't we try and you know encourage the virtual reality gamers to have a, a some sort of game that has terrible use of these weapons to start educating about it? And, you know, I also think as well as the lawyers, the decision makers, the, the tech industry and all the rest, 
I really think we need to have a conference that brings in the science fiction writers. I mean, I deeply believe with great um, chills down my spine that when you read many of the science fiction books from Margaret Atwood to others, they often have a vision of something that I think we could harness as experts in our areas. So that's some very crazy ideas, Philippa, but, you know, I think we need to bring them together plus rigorous books plus analysis of the existing normative framework. Thank you. Uh, all uh, fantastic ideas. Uh, I mean, clearly funding is key to a lot of this, and uh, I completely agree with you, Helen. This the science fiction, video games, uh, all of this um, are important for raising awareness, stimulating interest, and then spurring thought. Um, okay, great. I've just lost my own connection, but um, I'll carry on uh, because I know I'm more, I'm, st I'm still on the, uh, the larger uh, yeah, uh, video. Um, I did have another question, and so I'm just going to have to get that up. Or Meredith, perhaps you could, would you mind just reading it out to us? Um, and it was a question about the biological weapons convention um, and, and, and nano together with uh, bio from one of our have nanomaterials had a measurable impact on genetically modified biological weapons, BW, to date. Given that there isn't an international monitoring agency governing BW currently, is there a need for further scrutiny in this field of research as well as inclusion in the BWC? So, Kobe, uh, this question was really about the intersection between nano and bio. I think you've already yep. answered the question about the BWC because you did say, yes, it needs to acknowledge that nano is part of this. But Correct. maybe you want to say a little bit about the connection between nano and BWC. Yeah, so any, any modification of genetics would be at the nanoscale and therefore involve nanomaterials, it depend, depending on how you define it, but it would be, be nanoscale. So I don't know that, again, anything further is needed other than, you know, some statements from states as they come together to say that the BWC includes nano. Um, there's not a specific use of nano that I'm aware of to modify um, disease. It's just, you know, diseases or any kind of biological weapons can be developed. In terms of monitoring, I mean, that's the age-old question, but it also comes back to a lot of the work around the web of prevention. So monitoring bio is always hard. We know that um, having having all of the things that we've just talked about in terms of connections, but also building content and community, having scientists connected, knowing the risks of their work, even talking to each other in their coffee rooms and, you know, sharing with someone who will go, what, you're doing what? Why are you doing that? Uh, as well as a lot of the risks that you manage day to day, Philip, and know far more about than I do. Um, these are all these are all things that need to be covered again. I don't know that it's, it's necessarily, there's something new there to unpack uh, on that particular topic. Thank you. Um, are there any questions uh, in the room? Just have to go ahead. I do have a question. Uh, I was wondering how easy it would be to uh, is to weaponize this uh, this kind of technology, and uh, how easy it would be for uh, malign actors to uh, get their you know hands on this. Uh, sort of technology and develop uh, uh, any kind of, you know, weapons, uh, yeah, like massive destruction. Of yeah. Well, I suppose it depends on which kind of technology you mean. If you're talking about genetic modification, CRISPR Cas9 changed the game. So um, when I was at a conference in Norway, I remember just seeing them doing, um, you know, genetic modifications on their salmon, which is a way of, you know, a way to tag the salmon, the wild salmon from the, the domestic salmon. And each each interaction took a matter of seconds. So, you know, there's there are ways to do it. There are also ways to use viruses to change um, genetics. So I think the issue or the, the area that's probably the most interesting and that where research is racing forward at the moment, which was just starting when I started undertaking the research is really understanding the human brain and how to manipulate the human brain. So this is, I think, the new frontier in terms of um, in terms of access. How easy is it? Um, I don't think you're going to have people in their garages doing it. I think it's it's something that requires a level of sophistication and equipment to do. But that's not to say that there aren't things that you can do with nano that don't require um, high levels of sophistication. To the you know thermobarics are a good example that if you 
if you're creating materials on a nanoscale that you can create materials with different properties that might have toxicity or behave in certain ways that are unexpected, that they might be more available. But again, not, not necessarily posing uh, new or different risks that are not regulated already under the existing international law. And again, this is another thing that we haven't even touched on this, I'm conscious of the time. There was a chapter that I wrote in um, a book by Bill Boothby a couple of years ago where with Di Diana Bowman looking at a lot of these regulatory issues have already been looked at from a non-war perspective. We need to connect the conversations between peacetime and wartime as well. We don't need to reinvent the wheel just because there's armed conflict. We don't need to say, look, we need new law. We need to also think about where we've got effective regulatory frameworks during peacetime for really advanced sciences. What can we learn from those and how can we use those during wartime as well? So again, um, don't, need to, don't need to recreate it all. A lot of it's already there. Kobe, just before um, I, I close this out, I wanted to ask you uh, one final question uh, and I just want a one word answer. Um, with all of this, what is your outlook? Are you hopeful or are you not hopeful when it comes to emerging technologies, um, you know, warfare uh, and international law? I'm curious. Very good. I don't like I mean, binary answers. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think this is the right um, the right way to not actually answer, uh, and it shows uh, so much. I think about also what your book is about, right? You are a critical researcher. You question the question, and you don't necessarily directly answer the question. This is one of the things that's so important about your book. Uh, it's a very critical book. Um, we need more critical books like this. We do get into uncomfortable spaces. Uh, we continually find ourselves in uncomfortable spaces as critical researchers. We don't have all the answers. We have way more questions than we have answers. We're often in a group of experts on particular subjects, but we simply don't speak that language. Um, but it's really important to force ourselves into these um, uncomfortable, difficult, challenging uh, spaces in order to facilitate that cross uh, conversation across the technical expertises and the governance section. Se section. Um, I think we need to keep fighting these social silences. We need to keep fighting this power of ignorance, this power of non-knowledge to get some of that um, more exposed exposure of what the potential of these technologies are, I think is more important than ever. And your book is a really, really important part of that. So thank you so much for, for writing this book and getting it out there, being part of stimulating and engaging this conversation. Um, Kobe, uh, for those of you who um, want to pick up a flyer about the book, uh, it's available on the side here. There's also a discount on there. We'll circulate that to uh, all the virtual participants um, as well. Um, but for now, I will just um, thank you uh, again so much, Kobe, for writing the book, for uh, engaging in this conversation with us. Uh, Helen, to you as well, very warm thanks for taking the time um, and the energy that you bring to this debate, I think, was absolutely palpable. And uh, the two of you are uh, an absolute power couple. So thank you. It's been such a privilege.